Whitman and Gates resolved Japan to revise Article 9 of its constitution to develop offensive military capabilities. Contention 1 is the economy. Hasaba 17 of Wasada University writes that the current constitution and interpretations have long allowed the state to focus on economic development. This is because there is a guns and butter trade-off between military spending and social spending. The UPenn Wharton School 17 confirms that a large military budget leads to cuts to social welfare. Social spending is the best way to grow the economy because it targets the most vulnerable. Hiller 18 of the Peace Science Digest thus writes that a 1% increase in military spending decreases economic growth by 9%. An economic slowdown would threaten the entire region. Because Japan is a key producer and investor, Tonson 14 of PRIO writes that Article 9 set East Asia on its road to economic growth. Reversing this would be devastating, as Yang 19 of the World Bank concludes that in East Asia over the last few decades, a billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. Contention to his relations. Rodriguez 21 explains that during World War II, the Japanese military committed some of the worst atrocities in recorded history. The number of civilians deliberately killed during Japanese fascism reaches into the millions. As such, the ISDP 18 writes that an amendment to Article 9 would ignite protest amongst the country's neighbors due to historical Japanese imperialism. This would happen in three places. First is in China. Gui 14 of the CFR writes that the average Chinese still have deeply rooted apprehensions about Japan repeating its militarist mistakes. China would militarize in response, risking escalation. Wadsworth 19 of Pitt writes that the ensuing heightened mistrust between alliance partners in China increased the likelihood of a conflict escalating into war that would undoubtedly draw in the U.S. Second is in South Korea. Sheen 17 of Seoul National University finds that most Koreans are against Japan's constitutional reform and consider it a sign of Japan's revert back to militarism. South Korea would nuclearize to protect itself. Sun 21 of NYU writes that in military conflict, Japan could build a nuclear arsenal faster than South Korea could. This gives South Korea a strong incentive to build nuclear weapons preemptively. Rappaport 21 of Columbia finds that South Korea has taken steps to expand weapons technologies. While there is no indication of nuclear development, further pressure could result in nuclear weapons. This would quickly escalate, as Taylor 17 of the Washington Post finds that faced with the threat of South Korea developing nuclear weapons, the North may be incentivized to launch a preemptive strike. Third is in North Korea. Stebbing 17 of the University of Western Ontario writes that for North Korea, who views Japanese remilitarization as a threat, it would likely trigger a localized arms race, paving the way to future conflict. Indeed, Rodriguez explains that in one of the worst case scenarios, Japan's acquisition of offensive strike capabilities triggers a Korean or Chinese preemptive attack. Mixler 17 of Time writes that if North Korea launched a nuclear attack, the death toll would be 2.1 million in Tokyo and Seoul alone. But even if none of these wars break out on purpose, an arms race in East Asia would destabilize the entire region and increase the risk of miscalculation. Asaba 17 of Wasadi University writes that military expansion in neighboring countries would make all parties involved more prone to miscalculation. Finley 10 of UT Austin confirms that arms race increases the probability of war by 331%. At the very least, Mason 21 of the conversation finds that constitutional revision will send alarm bells ringing across the Asia Pacific, worsening relations with two of Japan's biggest trading partners, as well as damaging its regional image as a trustworthy leader of peaceful economic investment. To keep the peace in East Asia, Whitman is proud to negate. Cool. Uh, Monica, did you get everything? Yes, I did. And I sent our doc as well. Cool. Uh, and just for everybody's reference, we do read cards. I just, uh, we just like cut it like this for readability. Um, but is anybody not ready? Okay, cool. In that case, Lambert, affirmative, Bobby Missell. Lambert affirms in our first argument is military leverage. As Brookings 21 indicates that Japan shares economic or concerns about democratic recession and China's coercive diplomacy has long pressed to include democracies in Asia's regional architecture. However, Achari 12 furthers that Article 9 inhibits Japanese military intervention for the purposes of democracy assistance, setting the limitation on the use of military forces and Japanese response towards the military crackdown of pro-democracy movements in Burma and China at the end of the 1980s. 
However, Pierce Snow 6 explains that military support has had substantially improved the democratic standing of states, and the democratic changes wrought by military intervention have been long lived over a six year period. That's crucial, as Harplin 11 finds that democracies are less likely to become failed states or suffer civil war. As Thine 12 writes that civil wars have caused over 16.2 million deaths, and that trend gets worse unless you affirm. But our second argument is about averting global unrest. As Blackley 22 writes, as China will decline due to its lack of resources and risk becoming aggressive to achieve economic goals. As Susaku 20 quantifies, as China's economic growth could drop to 1.7% by the 2030s. Brands 22 furthers that the China of the 2020s will be a country whose coercive capabilities are more intimidating as its economic dynamism fades. That could be the worst possible combination, but thankfully, revising Article 9 turns China's decline into a silent one. First is by restoring credibility. As Gulab 22 finds, uh, with COVID, Afghanistan, tensions with Cuba, Iran, and North Korea, the U.S. is overstretched, facing too many perceived threats at once. As Schumann 22 furthers, as the perception that America is too weary to sustain its commitments has taken hold of the Chinese leadership. As Korsman 22 finds, that the U.S. needs to ex ex exercise that strategic triage to balance spending and create real-world strategic partnership with allied states. As Lin 16 writes, at the anticipation of a weak response from Japan convinces the Chinese government to advance its interest. But second is deterrence. As Siddhartha says 18 explains, that Article 9 influences funding restraints and limits contributions to regional security. A defensive force is only an effective deterrent if enemies understand that that force can be used. Because of this, Akiyama 21 finds that the frequency of intrusion by Chinese ships into Japanese waters has drastically increased, and Goro 21 finds that Japan plays a unique role due to its location and economic power. Lomas 18 writes, a conflict in gray zones is of great concern, with the possibility that an accidental clash could escalate and Tokyo could deter Chinese overreach. But finally, is bolstering regionalism. As CAD 17 explains that ASEAN's weak commitment for security makes it unlikely that the group will be able to tackle open disputes. So North 18 finds that no single member of the military strength to challenge the PRC. But with Article 9 revision, ASEAN has an opportunity to leverage one of the regional powers capable of challenging the PRC directly. Japan. As Hydra 19 furthers, uh, with powers like Japan engaging Asian members, the emergence of a regional order as opposed to one that is Sino-centric will occur. There are two main impacts to solving the overstretch problem, and the first of which is maintaining global commitments. As Gulab 22 writes that pragmatic options to deal with overseas crises have lost credibility and become hard to employ. Bendow 22 finds that adjusting foreign policy to reflect of available resources is the only way to avoid catastrophic failure. The U.S. is juggling the possibility of at least four wars at once, and by shifting burdens to regional allies, the U.S. can strengthen the credibility of its commitments while accommodating for a rising China. That prevents nuclear escalation or conflict in general, as Hankinson 17 finds tension stoked by assertive regimes and spark a large-scale war or even potentially nuclear exchange destroying the world. But second is preventing authoritarianism, as the Shit 21 writes that a common CCP seeks to make the world safe for authoritarianism and genocide. Freedom will drop around the world as human rights violations are excused, and China's imprisoned more than one million people in detention camps. Authoritarian countries will band together to erode human rights. That's why a report by the Freedom House in 2021 writes that the share of countries designated not free has reached its peak since its beginning in 2006. The shits concludes that China recently solidified its relationship with Russia and is working with smaller autocratic states. Allies that help balance against the CCP diminish that confidence. Thus, Lee finds that Japan's military normalization pretends the creation of a new alliance system in Asia. Things aren't working, so you affirm. Cool. Y'all ready for cross? Yeah. On your first word. Let's start time. Now, on your subpoint B, on your second contention, can you explain to me, like, why why can't Japan stop Chinese intrusions in Japanese water right now? Well, there's a couple. Uh, one, because considering they're, like, considered, like, contested waters, legally, there is a lot of ambiguity around what Japan is actually allowed to do to the, like, constitution and the legality of it is also super specific and that they're not allowed to do anything unless they believe that like you know the state of their country's survival is at risk which means that you know as much as chinese escalation might be occurring and there is you know obviously that makes it easier for miscalculation to occur it's legally under article 9 hard to actually implement defense in the status quo with that let's take a look at your c1 i'm just like a little bit confused the united states largest military budget in the world and has you know the largest economy in the world considering japan's economy is literally set up to take on more debt why and they're already spending this quo why don't like why do they have to cut welfare just do offensive weapons 
Um, sorry, my internet connection cut out. It, it, let me get, can you just like repeat your, your question? Very sure, just quickly, considering Japan's economy is set up to take on debt and they're already spending on, you know, defense and the status quo, why can't they, why do they have to cut welfare to spend on offensive weapons? Okay, yeah. So to answer like the part of your question about they're currently spending on defense, the problem is right now they're only spending 1% of their military budget because that's what Article 9 permits. And so therefore, when you repeal that, they're able to go up to like 2%, which is what other countries spend, a doubling in military budget. You have to get that money from somewhere. You can't just constantly take from debt. That's not a good, like, like they are going to have to take it from elsewhere. Well, like, well, just to, just to clarify then, I mean, so, I mean, that is like fundamentally how Japan's economy is set up. Like that's the, the kind of I mean, the whole point of the reason that they, like their banks buy back differently because they buy back directly from the government. But that's, that's besides the point. Um, just so we're clear, are you then saying that they will continue to spend as much as they are on defense and then also spend that on offensive weapons? Are you saying that for some reason they have to now spend like, like offensive weapons are more costly? I mean, you have, to, you have to invest more in a military if you don't have to do offense and defense. It's possible that the amount on defense goes down, but on net, the amount of military spending goes up because you now have to invest more in military because you have a larger military. That's pretty simple. Also, whether or not Chinese ba uh, Japanese banks buy back directly from the like d directly from the Japanese government doesn't matter. It still is bad economic practice to go into debt every single year. That's still unsustainable, no matter who they're buying back from. Right. I mean, but considering they have like the ninth, you know, I think largest military right now, even though like all of that budget is spent on defense, that's still regardless of how, what percent of GDP it is, that's billions of dollars, right? So I'm just a little confused on where you, I mean, you say it could go up to 2%. I'm confused on where you get that arbitrary number from because and, and why that means no more wealth. The arbitrary number that comes, it, it's not really arbitrary. 2% is what most countries spend on their military if they have offense and defense. That's where we get it. Okay, cool. Uh, do y'all need anything? Are y'all going to run prep before rebuttal? I, I just can't find this evidence, the Bandau evidence on your first impact. If you can point me to where that is in the doc, then I'm good to start. Yes, of course. And if we missed putting it in, I'm so sorry, and I will fix that right now. Let yeah, don't worry. Oh, I think I did miss that one. Um, Rodica, do you know where that is in the drive? Yeah, I do, actually. I think okay, cool. My computer logged out really badly. <laughs> so just one second. Awesome. Um, I've got it. Mm. Oh, there's a couple bandages. Bobby, can you check the um? Mm -hmm. Can you go to the card doc from last round and hit it from there? This is just taking an insane amount of time to open on my end. On the TUC dubs? That's the problem. We didn't uh, copy paste them on the TUC dubs. No, no, the, the other the actual dog. Oh my god. Opening any frame. Just go to the. I yeah, the sorry. Round we had. Just this, is, this is our drives are not working very well so we're trying to open up Duck. it's all good until you've watched novice policy debaters try to send an email chain and like i don't know lose the ability to use gmail or something for like ever like you, you have you're good this is totally within a reasonable amount of time don't stress <laughs> Okay, awesome. Um, I just got it. Let me put it in. Sorry about that.
Um, do you prefer that I put it into the email chain or do you prefer that I put it into like? You can just drop it at the bottom of the doc if that works. Um, do you see opt-ins? Shoot, the formatting didn't copy. That's so odd. But like the we read the cut cards, so you can just like, is that okay? Or do you want me to highlight it? I can totally do that too. Uh, yeah, just which line is it? Okay, awesome, totally. Um, nothing paraphrased. It's just yeah. Cool. Um, are we good to go, Dan? Uh, I mean, I'll run a little prep to look at it. Okay. Sorry about that, by the way. No, no worries. All right, HDNL on mute on the call. That was um, 12 seconds. Is everyone ready? Okay. On their first contention about military intervention, Article 9 no longer restricts Japan from sending troops abroad. Seed 19 of Reuters writes that in a historic shift in 2014, the government reinterpreted the constitution to allow Japanese troops to fight overseas, furthering Japan proposed a mission by its Navy and Middle East waterways. Second, turn this argument, Japan needs to stay peaceful to have legitimacy. Kono 95 writes that it's extremely important that Japan resolve war-related issues to enhance confidence with Asian neighbors and cooperate in the Asian Pacific. Third, you can turn it again. TAN 15 argues that Japan's push to become a normal military power risks alienating regional countries, Japan's selective and uh, approach to multilateralism could prove risky for the region's stability. Fourth, you can turn it one last time, affirming increases tensions with North Korea, undermining Indo-Pacific cooperation. Austin 17 writes that scaling back the alliance would destabilize Asia and beyond. It would ham Kim a strategic victory, removing the deterrent to its aggression. All of these turns make it significantly harder for Japan to intervene and promote democracy. On their second contention about China. First, China is defensive. Brands 21 of Hopkins writes that numerous scholars reach a similar conclusion. China attacks not when it feels confident about the future, but when it worries that its enemies are closing in. Here is the link comparison. A concessionary policy towards China has prevented war for 40 years, but as the pivot to Asia has intensified, China has started militarizing per the logic in their case, which proves our analysis correct. Second, you can turn this argument. Contesting China is what causes war. Zhang 16 of foreign policy writes that hegemony in East Asia confirms hardliners view that the United States wants to contain China, undermining moderates. Only hardliners unequivocally seek military power. It directly takes out their case because it empowers the sentiment of hardliners who want military expansion and to expand authoritarianism. On the link about credibility, first you can turn it. Wadsworth 19 of Pitt writes that a Japanese offensive strike could decrease confidence in the credibility of US power as a sign that Tokyo is losing confidence in American credibility. This causes more American allies to hedge with China or develop their own strike capabilities, which further increases instability. Also, generally, American credibility is non-unique. They don't explain why credibility increases when this goes up, like the wars in Ukraine and Afghanistan have already damaged credibility. They don't explain why getting rid of this reverses any of that. On their second argument about deterrence, they have to win that Japan backs down in the face of deterrence. Any sort of conflict, we believe, becomes far more likely when Japan aggresses in reaction to Article 9 getting repealed. So actor analysis is the highest layer of debate in this round. They have to win anything on the top shelf. Second, the status quo is on our side. There's no gray zone conflict right now. Xiao 21 writes that China and ASEAN have agreed on the code of conduct for the South China Sea. Beijing said it could regulate the activities of China to avoid conflicts. Third, you can turn their argument. The first piece of evidence they read says there's strong resistance within Japan to developing the strike capabilities that they say that they say ends up uh, deterring conflict. So that only happens when Article 9 is repealed. Fourth, even if Japan doesn't need parity to contest China, any semblance of creating deterrence takes forever. Wadsworth 19 writes that it would take a decade to properly equip and train forces for an effective offensive capability, which functions as a turn on their case because China preempts any up opportunity to eliminate a deterrent. It takes out all of their arguments on Taiwan on, on, on China because they invade while a window of opportunity is still open. On their last argument about cooperation, first, their evidence gives way too many alt causes for a weak ASEAN, no legal framework and rivalries in the South China Sea, neither of which change in their case. Second, you can turn their argument, imperialism prevents cooperation. Suzuki writes that Japan is burdened with stark past in World War II, which led to massive demonstrations during then Prime Minister Tanaka's visit to Southeast Asia. Third, their Aizuaka evidence also takes out their case. It says that Japan can counter China in the region primarily through diplomatic and technological support, none of which is restrained by Article 9. Fourth, Japan is an 
even a member of ASEAN, so they can't fiat in that it wants to be a regional power or that it gets invited to the bloc. None of that work is done in case, don't do it for them. Fifth, a cohesive ASEAN is impossible. Jack Nahan 22 reports that far from a cohesive bloc, the ASEAN claimants are bedeviled by mutual rivalries, trust deficits, hinder potential cooperation. On their first impact about war with the United States, war is not coming. Fair Net 13 of New South Wales writes that China's assertiveness does not presage conflict. The PLA has been circumspect and our conflict in the SDS appears unlikely. On their second impact about authoritarianism, it's not reverse causal. Countries don't automatically become democratic once they start aligning with the United States. And countries also eventually reject Chinese offers if it leads to authoritarianism. So there's no link. Thank you, Bo Nay. Um, awesome. Bob, you're unmuted. I'm unmuted. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let me switch, switch mics. Yeah. Mic. Okay. Sounds good. So, really quickly before we move on, I need to see a couple pieces of evidence. Is that okay? Yeah. I'll, I'm happy to share the doc with you. It should have everything. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's fine. But just to let you know and make sure that like you're okay with it, I give my rebuttals off the flow. So, I don't have like a doc to send you. So, if you want, yeah. I can call it back evidence if you don't want to send it. That's totally good. No, sure. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You can just call okay. it. Sounds good. So, can I see the evidence that says that countries always like move away from China when things start to get towards like authoritarianism? The very last thing that you read at the bottom of your case? That's an, that's an analytic. Analytic, that's fine. Can I also see the evidence that says that, sorry, I lost my place. Right, that there's no um, gray zone conflict right now. Mm -hmm. um, can I also see the evidence that says that uh, the protest evidence? Sorry. Uh... Which, what, what is it in response to? Um, it was right, at, I was in, uh, in response to uh, regionalism and it was right underneath that there's too many alt causes as to why regionalism isn't functional. Too many alt causes, yep. Awesome, Good. that's all I thank you. And then I'll stay unmuted so y'all know we're not prepping or anything with that. You see, grab the, actually I got it. So sorry, it was Suzuki. Mm -hmm. And then it was. Oh, so sorry. One more thing really quickly. Um, it was the second response you read that Japan needs to resolve like war issues first. It was yeah. right underneath the collective defense response. That yeah. one thing. Uh, grab that. Then, sorry, Barnica, what else was it? Um, the second response that you read that Japan needs to resolve like war issues. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I got that. I meant, um, so I have the regionalism turn and then that turn on your c1 and what else did you want other than that? um that was it yeah i think the other uh, thing so you're good okay so i said awesome i'll you know if you get it Um, let me refresh one more time and hopefully I get it. Okay, awesome. I just got it. Um, with that, I think Bobby will probably review that during... Actually, we'll just run some prep really quickly starting. Okay, cool. That was four seconds. Um, it's just going to go our arguments and my opponent's arguments. Is everyone ready? Okay, sounds good. Felix says the highest level in today's should, debate should be actor analysis, but unfortunately, there's very few warrants behind everything he tells you. Let's start with his first response about collective defense. The biggest caveat to this establishment of Japanese policy is the fact that the Japanese people have to be under threat for them to do anything or go abroad. That's really important because that means Japan can't truly stand up for its allies or truly stand up for the interests of other countries without the Japanese people being in threat, which is why they're not a great leader. But furthermore, he talks about how Japan needs to resolve past war issues and all of that, but recognize that Japan is already doing everything it can to mutually enhance cooperation and confidence today. Because of economic things, they build trust. However, what Japan lacks is the credibility that other allies will think, hey, Japan will stand up for us when things get tough. 
When you revise Article 9, we reinstate that credibility because the relations have already begun improving. Then he goes on to tell you that, well, regional alliances aren't going to work. They'll never work with Japan, but there's not really any warranting here. Furthermore, they say, well, everything will become bad with North Korea, but that's just an extension of their case. Let's go to the China argument. They say, well, China only gets aggressive when people are closing in, but here's what they don't miss. Even if Japan gets you know, a revision of Article 9, they will still not be able to completely take over China like they did during the period of imperialism. That's really, really important because today, China doesn't see Japan the same way that they did before. They recognize that Japan is nowhere near something that's an existential threat to China. But furthermore, even when the United States credibility was declining and no one was encircling them, they still lashed out. They still tried to expand militarily and they're still spreading their influence, which is also why when they go to their next response about hardliners, the cost of war just becomes higher, if anything. Then, on their argument of how Tokyo is going to lose confidence in the United States and how credibility won't go up, the script's evidence says that the U.S. specifically wants Japan to revise Article 9. Then they get up and say, well, Japan's going to aggress, but there's no warrant here. Again, Felix, where's the actor analysis you were talking about? Then they said there's no gray zone conflict, but that's just not the fact. Like, their evidence just speculates something might happen, but, like, China's literally putting ships into the ocean. They're literally building islands. Like, that's just what's going on in the squo. Then they say, well, oh, Japan takes way too long to build weapons. What we say is a question of reposturing. They've literally hit the sixth highest spending of their military right now, meaning that they have the funds to invest, and they would just be a question of how they use their existing military. Lastly, on regionalism, they say there's way too many alternative causes, but the fundamental issue with this is this is why we need Japan. Someone that has credibility to mediate and unify them and advocate for them when countries like China try to run them over. That's why when he says, well, China's countries just reject Chinese authoritarianism, there's no evidence behind this. The fact of the matter is our evidence concludes that countries are becoming more authoritarian. Let's go to their argument about the economy. Remember what I already tell you is for the conversation evidence, the Japan military spending has already hit the highest. That means military spending is largely non-unique, but even beyond that, none of their evidence about how like economic growth is going to go down is specific to Japan. You probably don't even evaluate this argument because Kishida's platform is based on growing the economy. Let's go to their argument about relations. We say, first off, countries don't act on impulse. They're going to wait and see the kinds of actions that Japan takes, which is why even when they reinterpreted Article 9 and Japan supposedly gained more capacity, there wasn't as so much of an offensive measure from any country. Countries have political rhetoric all the time that, hey, we're going to preemptively strike you. We're going to do this, that, and the other, but they would never take the threat of endangering themselves with the United States like their own analysis tells you or getting into a conflict without a reason for it. But second, we say that so many countries have revised from imperialism. For example, Germany, even China after the Cultural Revolution, simply because they have new governments that do different things. We say Japan is on the same trend. But more on China specifically, we say their Wadsworth evidence is horrible because it only looks at things from a foreign policy's perspective without giving regard to the fact that Japan and China are so economically interconnected that China realizes Japan won't ever do anything because they're too reliant on that. On South Korea, the Kim 16 evidence explicitly says that because South Korea is so trade dependent, they would never risk proliferation. Even so, the similar threat perceptions of Japan and South Korea avert that. Lastly, on the North Korean nuclear strike, the sharp evidence says that not only is an arms race happening right now, but even beyond that, North Korea is way more afraid of South Korea than they ever will be of Japan. And the rapid evidence they talk about simply is the worst case scenario with no real warranting as to why North Korea would endanger themselves. Awesome. Are you all ready for cross? We see South Korea's trade dependence so they won't get a nuclear weapon. And can we see the sharp evidence that in the response to the North Korea argument? Um, let me grab that for you. Um, Bobby, can you get sharp? I got no code. Um, if you haven't gotten it yet, I can get it because I already got the circle stuff. Oh, okay. Okay, awesome. Let me grab that then. Actually, uh, yeah, yeah. Right, right. You got it. Okay, sounds good. That's just sharp 20, yeah. 20 something, 22, yeah. Awesome. My email is set. Let me know when you'll get it. And you're sorry, your email had both? Yep. Oh, um, no, no, I just Bobby said sent one well. and I sent one. Bobby's is the sharp evidence. Um, and then mine is the um, trade stuff. Sorry about that. Sounds good. No worries. Okay, I have Bobby's. Okay, maybe just give it one more second to come through. And yeah. then if it doesn't, I can just copy paste it at the top of our case doc. Um, I've had to do that a couple of rounds because my email just keeps lagging out on me. Okay. 
Okay, I think Bobby just got my email, so it should come to y'all as well soon. Mm. Well, I just got it. Okay. Uh, cool. Across then, or would y'all? Oh, like we're gonna prep. We're gonna prep. Okay, sounds good. We'll start. We'll start. Now. Oh, sorry, HD, was it 237 total or 237? 237 then, so. Okay, so then 15, so three, eight seconds left. All right, you ready now? Yes, for sure. You can take the first question. Okay, on your first contention, we say that Article 9 does not restrict Japan from sending troops to other countries. Yeah. You say that people have to be under threat yeah. for, Japan, for them to support Japan sending troops. Yeah. So does that mean that your argument is that when Article 9 gets repealed, Japan becomes under threat, so then people support sending troops to other countries? No, 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 not at all. It's simply that that clause doesn't exist, so Japan can do things like use their military in other countries without their people being under threat. It's but, definitely not that we should endanger the Japanese people. That'd be ridiculous. Well, okay, yeah, I, I didn't think that was your argument. Just, that's the way I thought it came out in rebuttal. But um, on, so why does, but if they've reinterpreted away that clause, then why does that matter? Article 9 matter anymore? You know, they right. haven't. So with the Japanese cabinet release after the reinterpretation was essentially saying, yes, we're going to have this policy of collective self-defense because we want Japan to sort of be more involved. However, the caveat that was sort of included in this clause is that collective defense can only be employed when they think that a situation will pertain to hurting the Japanese populace directly. Right. So, for example, when there's issues in other countries, like take like, like the genocide in Myanmar that Japan wanted to intervene in but ended up with weak military support, they were unable to do so because as bad and horrific as that genocide is, it doesn't really do anything to the safety of the Japanese populace. So because of that, they weren't able to successfully employ stuff. It's situations like that. Do you mind if I take a question? Go ahead. Sounds good. So let's talk about your North Korea argument. So mm -hmm. looking at sort of the Rodriguez evidence that you read, it simply just asserts that the worst case scenario that could possibly happen is like a preemptive strike. 
But insofar as sort of you tell me yourself that if all of this were to happen, the United States would get involved and there'd be nuclear weapons everywhere. What is a country's incentive to sort of put their entire regime at risk for the idea that Japan may or may not maybe act on this cause change in their constitution? Uh, It seems like we both seem to agree that the primary goal of North Korea and the Kim regime is to ensure the survival of their regime. So they view the threat of their historic colonizer and imperializer um, as increasing when Japan repeals Article 9 and develops offensive capabilities. So they believe that they're put then in a try or die situation. Either Japan will strike them when their capabilities get fully developed, or they launch a preemptive strike before Japan has capabilities and try to eliminate those capabilities before Japan can develop them. Really quick follow-up, though, what I'm sort of confused about, though, right, is that if Japan isn't taking any sort of indication that they're going to posture against North Korea, whereas literally countries like the United States and South Korea have, and on top of that, like, Kim knows that if we fired someone, something at Japan, the United States will for sure get involved. Why is it likely that he's going to turn away that for sure guarantee of U.S. involvement and basically, like, regime destroyal for the maybe chance that even without any posture or even so much as Japanese rhetoric that they're going to attack North Korea? In response to your second part of your question about the United States getting involved, it's just the same response that I gave to your last question. They believe it's a try die situation. The regime will go down if Japan develops offense capabilities. In response to the first part of your question about, uh, and I'll, I'll just finish answering, but in response to the first part of your question about it not being tar- not targeting North Korea, the point of our case is that it's seen as a symbolic revision, a return to their past that they think will be used to target them. I see evidence with the caveat. Yeah, definitely. Let me grab that for you. Um, Bobby, can you answer that as well? Because my sure, take a um, just that collective defense uh, means that the Japanese populace needs to be endangered. Oh, I have that. Yeah. The Japanese cabinet mm-hmm. evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Yep, I will send that. Um, show me a piece of evidence that is before you send it, just so it's the correct one that I used in the bottle, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Is it this? Um. Yes, yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Cool, I got you. I love his laptop so much more than mine. I was saying something. It's my laptop too. <laughs> All right, that was just said. I'll let you know when I get it. Awesome. Oh, I just got it. Uh, Felix will read it while, while like I speak. So I'm good if everyone else is. Yeah, we're good to go. Well, it'll start off on my case, then it'll go to their case. Is everyone good? Okay, cool. You're going to be voting neg on our second contention. Extend the argument. Rodriguez finds that Japan committed some of the worst atrocities in World War II and has still not been, been forgiven. We're going for our China link specifically. Gui finds that China's deep apprehensions of Japan's military, which would cause China to militarize too. Wadsworth finds that that would increase the chance of war, especially one including the U.S. Even if this doesn't happen, a regional arms race would increase the chance of miscalculation and repealing Article 9 would destroy Japan's image as a regional peacekeeper and trading partner. We're going for the first, uh, uh, like start off at the top 
top shelf response. They say that this should have happened with reinterpretations like in 2014. The problem is, is all of those were defensive, things like allowing for collective self-defense. Obviously, that's not going to put China in risk because they still can't start a war. This, it, it hap this changes when you fully repeal Article 9, now allowing them to start a war. That's the difference. Then they try to say that they would like that th that Germany and other countries should prove. No, the problem is that like Germany, for example, was never never had a pacifist constitution, but Japan does. So Japan moving away from a pacifist constitution would you, would uh, prove a shift in mindset, which China would interpret as them trying to become aggressive against China. On our link specifically, they try to say that Japan and China are economically tied. If this is true, we would take out both, case, both cases because both of our cases are about China starting a war. But also, our evidence is our evidence is very clear that China thinks that Japan would be willing to actually start the war. At that point, they're going to care more about security than the economy. Go to their case. Start off on the C1. Uh, we're going to like send the evidence of the Sieg evidence about how in the historic shift in 2014, the government reinterpreted the constitution to allow Japanese troops to fight overseas for then Japan proposed a mission by its Navy in Middle East waterways. They try to say that, oh no, it has to be a direct threat. Obviously that's not true. This is proven by the empiric that we read in rebuttal about how in, how in 2015, they, they proposed this uh, mission to the Middle East, even though there was no direct threat to the Japanese people. Obviously they're able to propose these missions if they want to. With that, go to their second contention. Remember the brands actor analysis that Felix says at the top of case? We, at the top of this contention, we tell you that China only attacks when other countries are encircling it and closing in. As to, as this is proven by the pivot to Asia recently by the United States, causing China to become more aggressive. Empirically, this uh, the, the, uh, this like concessionary tactic has led to peace for 40 years. They try to say that they would that there is no existential threat by uh, Japan. We would say sure but but no they would say that they have deeper apprehensions from history in addition they try to say that they lashed out without encircling in the past no we would say that there was there, there was no war the, the all of the impacts in this round are about war we tell you wars never happened for 40 years that goes conceded then they try to say that um yeah yeah go to on the first link specifically about credibility they try to say, that, oh, no, the U.S. wants the shift. Yes, that's because the U.S. wants these shifts and they can play less of the role in Asia. That's going to decrease credibility. On the second contention about deterrence, they just try to say they have the funds to do the, to uh, to uh, get deterrence quickly. Our, our evidence, our Wadsworth evidence says it takes 10 years to get the capacity to do it. It's not a question about funds. On C3 regionalism, they can see that Japan isn't part of SCN and never will be. That's terminal defense. Very awesome. Um, I don't need to call for anything, but really quickly before we start prep, Bobby and I are going to switch our microphones so you can hear me better. Okay. Sorry, I was just yelling at him for the feedback thing. We're going to start our prep. We used 10 seconds earlier. Now.
we have that as all of your prep. Yep, I got you. We do too. Sounds good. So order of the speech, I'm just going to cover our arguments, a little bit of comparative, and then I'll go over to my opponent's arguments. Is anybody not ready? Is there we go? Okay, sorry. Now we're good. Our authoritarianism argument is doing pretty well in the round, and it's where you're going to be voting. Let's explain why. We know from COVID, Ukraine, to Afghanistan, the United States is fundamentally overstretched, giving regimes like China an in to do what they need to do, whether it's influencing other countries in authoritarianism or genocide in their country, and there isn't a credible response. Our argument is about the credibility of the U.S. alliance, but rather the credibility that someone will respond to defend democracy, and that's what Japan does in the affirmative world when they're unconstrained by Article 9 to balance spending and create real-world strategic partnerships so that Japan is able to defend democracies and intervene and stop countries from getting away with genocide. If a bad example is set, China spreads authoritarian goals unchecked, it spreads that message that authoritarianism is a viable option and so is genocide on the world stage. You know that we're seeing a record deterioration between Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, all continuing to slip to the Chinese grip as the United States grip on the region continues to loosen. They make you four general responses. One, they say there was a 2014 reallocation and that they had one proposed thing in the Middle East that proved that to be true. But A, they still fundamentally cannot fight or intervene in some of these other countries for democracy, so it doesn't really prove anything. But B, their evidence just says the plan was uh, like a proposed, but it never actually happened. Two, they say China only attacks when they're encircled. Our argument is even about war, but we know that A, China is escalating right now as the United States is going away, which probably proves that's not true, but B, the cost of war goes up in the affirmative world, so they're less likely to escalate. Three, they say that the United States, like, credibility goes away because, B, you know, they think that Japan is waning away from them. Problem is, is that A, the script's evidence is conceded that the United States is literally them encouraging Japan to remilitarize so the, about, like, alliance is more balanced, but B, credibility is already going away now. Finally, they talk about how it takes 10 years to get military set up. And while A, our argument is even about deterring China from going to war, but B, remember what Varnica tells you, that they can easily reposture a lot of their military, right? Switch it from defense to offense. A helicopter acts all the same. So they're able to do at least some defense to deter China. With that, we're, you say, go to the Wang. You say you're always preferring genocide over their arguments. Insofar as genocide happens under the cover of the state, war scenarios are hyped up and talked about. So actors like the UN to the US always have a reason to de-escalate pretty peacefully before the war even starts. But when we chase hyperbolic war scenarios that have been predicted for decades, like my opponents try to get you to do, we ignore the slow burning violence that we know is happening right now. You can either chase ma big magnitude impacts like they're trying to do and get stuck not solving anything or solve for structural violence that's being ignored. But go over to their arguments. Now, once again, Felix talks about actor incentive, but they just assert our evidence may thinks that Japan is going to war with China. Here's two problems. One, China's economically interlinked with Japan, and they know that Japan also is a mutually assured destruction treaty with the United States. If China were to go to war with, the, like, or to Japan, that would destroy their economy and likely end up destroying their country. They know Japan has no incentive to strike them because of how interlinked their economies are, and China has no reason to strike. They wouldn't risk their country. And we know that's historically too. True, like, when Japan bought the Sunakus, infringing on Chinese sovereignty, we saw literally no military response. Only time we do is when we the U.S. pull out. Cool. Um, are y'all ready for Graham? Felix, do you have a question? Um, yeah, sure. Like, what... Can you just explain to me how Japan is able to, like, fight for democracy and authoritarianism or stop genocide, even if Article 9 is repealed? And your link is true that Article 9 is the reason why they can't fight abroad? 100%. What Bobby explains to you in summary, as well as our evidence case, is simply that because Japan is one of the oldest democracies in the world, they have the capacity to counterbalance the authoritarian influence of China. So when, you know, countries that are there, so I guess it's kind of manifest in two ways. One, authoritarian countries now think they can get away with things like genocide and other really, really mm. horrific things because they think, look, China's doing it unchecked. I guess we can too. So China gives those countries confidence. But beyond that, we think that because Japan sort of has that willingness and that capacity like they've proven before to sort of not only counterbalance China ideologically, but give countries someone else to turn to, knowing that if they don't follow China's footsteps, they can still be successful and be successful under the reign of democracy. That example setting is what we say causes that shift and also what our sort of evidence and authors indicate. I'll take a question. Let's go to the argument on y'all's case about this like China stuff. So 
I think one of the biggest emphasis that y'all make in this round is on actor analysis. So my question is, given that you do not read any analysis as to why Japan would want to strike China, and you kind of hedge all of your bets on this idea that China thinks Japan is reverting back to imperialism and history, but if all of that is true, why would China base the survival of their regime, the massive U.S. nuclear war you talk about, on a hunch that Japan might do something when there's never any proof that they would? Our argument is not that Japan gains capacity to attack China or Japan attacks China. Our argument, which is backed up by all of this evidence and all the like weighing that's done on your second contention that's not responded to, is that China believes that when countries around it become more military, militarily powerful, there is a threat, which is then when they start the war, which is empirically confirmed by all of the examples in HD summary. When we use a conciliatory policy toward China generally for the last 40 years, they did not start a war, but increased like the, the recent pivot to Asia means that they're escalating right now, as you say in response to this argument follow up. So I'm kind of thinking back to HD summary. And what I remember is him just simply extending the idea that, well, in the past 40 years, we haven't had a conflict. But what's really, really important is we're not saying that the sort of the doomsday scenario that's going to happen is conflict. We're saying that it's rather going to be like ideological. But that aside, in specific to your case, what Bobby and I tell you in both summary and rebuttal, that unfortunately HD kind of doesn't get to, is this idea that the United States presence has been waning in recent years. That's important. Yeah. Despite not being encircled, the argument that China continues to militarize more, builds up more nuclear weapons. Even if, that, even if that's true, the response in summary is that our impact is about war and China is not starting a war right now. And they have not. I said the words that China is escalating right now as the United States influence continues to wane. Escalating. When the U.S. goes away. I said those words. I, 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 I talked about how the U.S. is currently pivoting to Asia. That's in my summary. Right, and I, I just, that's time. We can discuss this in speech. All right, uh, we'll run eight seconds when we have one more call. You call me, you call me. I did. No, I know, but like, I'm saying call again. We'll start prep now. Okay. Um, it's going to start on the weighing debate, and then it's going to go to our case, and then it's going to go to their argument about intervention. Okay. There is not enough work done on this weighing for you to consider new genocide framing in second summary. They don't explain how the United Nations is able to stop a war between China and Japan, so it doesn't specifically take out our scenario. All death is bad. Even so, they've conceded that our argument is a prerequisite. Japan needs good relations to be able to intervene and stop genocide in countries across Asia. So if we win our case that Japan's relations with its neighbors get worse, then that prevents their ability to stop genocide. So you're looking to our case first. Let's go there. The only response is number one, that they're economically linked, and that number two would risk war with the United States. Group both of these. They have conceded the front line that Japan, that China believes that when Japan develops offensive strike capabilities, that will be used to target its country. So China believes that Japan repealing Article 9 is a reversion back to its militaristic past and a sign that the Chinese state and economy will no longer exist because Japan is militarizing now. All of the actor analysis here is conceded and completely undercovered in their summary. Our brand's evidence indicates that China attacks when countries are closing in, which is why while there was no war for 40 years with a concessionary policy, China only started aggressing when the United States started pivoting towards Asia. All of that uniqueness is on our side. On their flow, on the China argument, they have two responses. First, they say China's escalating right now. Yeah, they're escalating right now because we're pivoting to Asia right now. And even if they are escalating, it's not war. The only way a war starts is when Japan repeals Article 9. Then they say that it increases the cost of war through deterrence. Are, they have conceded that China does not care about deterrence. That is, it escalates when the cost of war goes up. It does not get deterred. Okay, so that's the China debate. But the only offense they have left in the round, they're not winning. Our SIEG evidence finds that Article 9 no longer restricts Japan from sending troops abroad. The cabinet has interpreted Article 9 to allow for collective self-defense, meaning Japan can do the kinds of interventions that they say are so crucial to stop genocide. They say two things. First, they say Japan can't fight for democracy right now. That is untrue. Clearly, Japan is able to fight for democracy because they sent a mission to the Middle East to do the kinds of things they say. Then they say that the mission was only proposed but it went through. So they're staking their whole case on the idea that this mission was proposed. I'm happy to send you our evidence. It says that it went through. So they have no case. Very simple ballot for the day. 
Okay, sounds good. So it's going to be my opponent's arguments. Actually, it's going to start on our arguments about authoritarianism, then my opponent's arguments in panel. Is everyone ready? Okay. My opponents lose this round when their summary chalks up this entire debate to be about four. Our argument is everything but that. The fact of the matter is now, like Bobby extends the goal of evidence, that the United States commitments are waning. And he gives actual examples pointing out between the pullout in Afghanistan, the fact that they're not actually committing troops to East Asia, and the disaster scenario that happened in Ukraine. Not only do our allies not trust the United States, but China doesn't either. That's really important because China now thinks they can get away with whatever they want. And it's not just China, it's other authoritarian regimes too. They think no one's going to check us, we can do whatever we want, which by the Freedom House evidence can that it's increased almost 75%. That's really devastating because you know that over 1 million people in China are being genocided in this moment. But when you revise Article 9, you not only counterbalance China ideologically, but you give Japan the credibility so other countries can say, hey, look, there is a route that is not China, that is not authoritarianism, that's successful and credible. The one response that Felix hedges everything on is this idea that, well, they have collective defense. Take their argument at their highest ground. Our argument is still perceptual that countries don't see the credibility with Japan. But even beyond that, Bobby's frontline is stellar. Our evidence explicitly says they can only go in when it's about Japanese survival. That doesn't matter if they did one random excursion in the Middle East when they literally do not have the back of their allies as per literally the evidence given by the Japanese cabinet. That's why let's go to the Wang debate. The prior that they give you is, oh, we need good relations with our allies. The only country they talk about is China. We don't need good relations with China to counter China. This prereq makes no sense at all. But the genocide Wang is really, really good. Good. Felix can see the second part of what Bobby says that because genocide happens under the cover of countries, it's never focused on. Big war scenarios are always going to be publicized in the media and taken care of, which is why they always get addressed first, and the genocide of millions of people gets pushed aside. So let's go to their case. The biggest concession that they make is that Japan's not going to intervene. He talks a lot about actor analysis, but China knows that Japan needs China. China's a pretty smart country. They would never think a country that's reliant on them is going to attack them. Beyond that, China's not going to risk their regime's survival of a U.S. nuclear war. At that point, because China's a smart country and Japan only makes it harder to fight, you know, Ooh, good, good round, Lambert. Good round, y'all. Yeah. Always fun debating. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I gave the last decision, so I will, um, like, start this off. Um, firstly, congratulations on making it to octaves of the TOC. Um, both teams did an amazing job and this was a great debate. So um, this was a 2-1 for the AF. Um, I gave the decision for the NEG, so I'll give my RFD first. Also, I'm the one who's already talking, so I think that makes the most sense. Um, this was a really interesting debate for me to evaluate. Ultimately, like, I, okay, so I start the evaluation of this debate with the question of, like, can Japan effectively defend democracy in the region? Um, so I think that has a couple different components, things like, is China going to be aggressive in response? Um, but ultimately, I think that the question of ideological balance and credibility becomes a problem when the kind of affirmatives only real response to everybody in the region is really, really stressed about Japan trying to remilitarize is just Japan wants to spread democracy. And like, that's great, but I don't see what that does for like the Vietnamese and people from Laos and Cambodia who have made it very, very clear in several pieces of evidence that the negative has read that they don't want Japan's help. Um, I think that substantially checks back against Japan's ability to, uh, firstly, I don't think the plan gives Japan credibility in that case, right? Because there is no regional credibility if this is viewed as a move to imperialism and militarization. Um, I think the negative has read several pieces of evidence that have gone conceded and have been extended that say that. Um, so then I kind of, I mean, like that is in itself almost sufficient in a world where the framing is a question of like structural violence and genocide. Um, like this will just be a move that creates conflict in the region. Uh, but the other components of this is, so I end up looking at this like question of collective self-defense, to what extent can Japan intervene in particular situations? Um, I think that the 
let me see if I can see the specific piece of evidence I read, the Richter evidence um, actually specifically says, um, here we go, I can, I can read you the line. The Richter evidence says, on July 1st, 2014, Article 9 now permitted Japan to exercise collective self-defense and to come to military aid of an ally under attack. Um, and yes, it does say, oh, actually, I'm sorry, this says the government has reached a conclusion that not only when an armed attack against Japan. Um, yeah, which I will say um, to a potentially concerning implication is the opposite of the direction that the card is cut in. Um, but in any case, in that, in that case, there's no reason that Japan can't already sufficiently do this. And the attempt to like give them more resources to do it is just going to make everyone in the region like freak the fuck out. And oh my love, just that in. Sorry. Um <laughs> anyway, and I think like that leads to even if it doesn't lead to war, like I think everybody gets a whole bunch of conflict going on. So I vote neg. Um, I think that like the AF is a sufficient shift back to Japanese imperialism to mitigate any potential impacts. Um, and I don't know why both of my judges, other judges just disappeared, but um, I, that's my RFD. Cool. Um, Jesus, an alarm just started going off next to me, but this is quick anyway. Um, I voted for Lambert because Whitman simply did not do extensions in the back half of the round. Um, and I find it incredibly upsetting that I have to adjudicate this round in the same way that I adjudicate rounds between my novices, because this is TOC does. I also think that Lambert is ahead on many of the Lake and Wayne debates. I don't actually think the genocide weighing is too late because it's weighing, not framing. So I feel comfy evaluating it. Um, in contrast, Barnica responds to the pre-reg pretty well on the authoritarianism link. I think that the encirclement debate is a wash, considering that Lambert's argument is not actually about war or conflict. And I think that the Japan-like operation in the Middle East was proposed, but not performed. And Whitman also didn't extend their case, so I cannot vote there. This is a pretty clear ballot for me. I really have to run because I have class, but my email is in my paradigm of few questions. Okay, uh, I, I'm the last one. Uh, I'm uh, basically uh, I uh, base uh, my judgment on, on the te uh, technical uh, side. Uh, I'm not uh, like use my own opinion to uh, judge uh, the uh, if the uh, case is right or is wrong or something like that. Uh, basically, uh, both uh, present their case uh, very well, uh, especially the first speaker of uh, NEC team, uh, very uh, well organized and uh, concisely, and uh, uh, both did uh, uh, balance uh, in the uh, rebut uh, rebuttal, uh, but um, uh, I think uh, uh, the second speaker of the uh, F, uh, the uh, a little bit better than the uh, other size. So that's uh, why my votes goes to. Uh, they do, did also very uh, balanced in the uh, cross file checking. That's uh, my reason. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much to all of the judges. Really good round, Whitman. A lot of fun debating y'all. Thank, thank you. Good luck, Lambert. Thank good you. Luck. See y'all.